Welcome to the We Are Libertarians book club, monthly book club. If you're listening to this, you are a Patreon member already. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I am Hody Johns. I am here with Hadley and Jacob. Guys, how you doing? Doing great, Hody. Yep, doing solid. Great. So this last month we had uh, The Road to Serfdom, which is always considered kind of one of those, if you had to make a top 10 list of libertarian books, it would kind of be one of the ones on there. Uh, by Friedrich Hayek. Uh, he's uh, kind of an Austrian economist. Uh, and if you read the book, not a really big fan of socialism, and you probably gathered that much. Um, now, I'm sure that we'll talk later on about how, you know, socialism is kind of morphed. And in fact, at the, uh, in the preface of the book that I had, he even specifies that he says, you know, I, I talk in favor of liberalism, but then I look what the Americans have and what they call liberalism. And I'm like, not, not that though, not that. And so, uh, definitions change even in his era, the same word didn't mean the same thing in different places. So there's just a, um, there was a lot to digest. Uh, it's an econ book, but it wasn't one of those, I, I think sometimes you read an economy book and it's got a lot of graphs and a lot of history. This was just observations, stories. I can see why it's kind of up there for libertarians because even people that aren't necessarily econo economically versed, it's a very easy read. Um, what were some impressions you guys have? We'll just talk about our initial impressions. Um, Hadley, why don't we start with you? Okay. Yeah, as I relate a little before we started here, I, uh, I was a bad book club member this month and only got about almost halfway through the book with travel and other situations that were going on. Um, but I think as it was kind of going along, each chapter was just kind of reiterating what was already said. And um, obviously, as you said, it, it seems like he's a huge fan of socialism and uh, <laughs> central planning. And he thinks that's the end all be all. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic for those that are can't see me. <laughs> um, he was very much against it, and I think because of he saw the rise of Nazi Germany from being in Austria at that point before he left, and it was incredible. You know, I know a little bit, but the aspect of England through that time of how much people really did look at central planning and communism uh, and socialism as the end all be all. Everybody that was kind of the uh, trend at that point in time and he's sitting there like well, what don't you understand there's really it's you think fascism and Mussolini and Hitler is you know the, the the one end but really it's one step away from what you believe you know if you start giving too much power to the central government then it can become a fascist state so um, I will still read the book and finish it um, over this next month so so far I have enjoyed it that of which I have read all right good deal how about you Jacob yeah, I love that you said it was an easy read. You know, <laughs> it's uh, no, it was good. Um, there are some tough parts in there, but I thought it was a good, you know, overall kind of a once over of the fight between, you know, economic freedom versus some centralized authority, you know, directing where the market goes. So uh, from that perspective, I think he did a good kind of a diagnosis of, you know, this is where we're at right now. And, you know, if we want to go down the, the route of socialism, this is the end state of it, you know, where he's just saying it's not going to happen. It's not going to go down the way you think it is. You know, it's not going to be the, um, I forgot what phrase you, it wasn't paradise, but he used some phrase about that, uh, like early on in the book. But uh, overall, just had a lot of uh, good, I think, good examples of um, complex economic and social issues that were arising at the time. And basically saying, you know, whenever the government tries to plan the economy, like, Things don't go well, which if you've been listening to the wall for the past three or four months, you know that the second government interjects, you know, things go from bad to worse, no matter how well intentioned, your, you know, your plans are for it. You know, uh, a lot of people that work for the government, you know, and myself included, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning people, but the end state of a central planned, you know, authority outside of the privatization, you know, company itself. You know, you're just going to get in the way at the end of the day. At worst, you're going to cause a, a lot of irreparable damage to the economy. So uh, I guess that's my once all over of the book, I would say. Yeah, and uh, he does reiterate uh, the several point kind of in different, the same point in different ways. And really, that's kind of the only difference in each chapter. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a book that 
progresses that like builds upon itself. It just kind of says, okay, so we've looked at it this way. Let's look at it from this way. But you're looking at the same it each time. And that really is the, and he really had a battle uh, in his. So I, I decided to add a bonus book for, I guess, myself. Um, I had been meaning to read Paint Hayek forever. I'd seen the overviews. I was kind of familiar with it as a historical basis, but I also read that book this last month and it was, uh, it, I, and I hate to say this, it was probably the better book of the two books. <laughs> um, the guy who does the biographies for both Keynes and Hayek, you can tell he's very unbiased and very understanding of both points of view, but acknowledged one of the big issues was Hayek was fighting against Keynes because Keynes was into central planning and didn't. And, and the funny part is the more I, I learned about Keynesian economics, the more it wasn't, it really is just central planning. Keynes didn't prescribe the same remedy in every situation. The reason, in fact, when he was treasurer, somebody wrote and they said, well, you made all these, you know, you've, you've written all these things. Why do you still need to be treasure? And he said, well, because there's no rule of thumb. I just, I'm good at it. I don't know that everybody's good at it, but I saved the treasury a few, you know, million pounds every month. And that was really eye opening to me as far as what Keynes had in mind was this, was, was the centralized planning was this, the, there really isn't a rule that you follow. You just need to have the right person in charge who makes the right decision. And that was kind of where he was coming from. Hayek was obviously for the laissez-faire thing. Now this also bled over, and this um, this is a lot to do with Hayek's history, him being Austrian and watching the fall of the, um, the rise of nationalism, uh, the security of borders. You might remember uh, Alsace Lorraine, uh, which was which was a commingling of German and French people. And one of the reasons this led to a lot of wars is because they uh, Germany adopted economic policies that involved um, income tax. And so if you have an income tax, you have to know your your people in your region. Before that, most of the world, including America, was just doing tariffs. And tariffs, um, while still not great, and it's still a tax, and I'm not for them, you don't have to keep track your number of people because you just tax everything that gets import imported to your harbors, and that's that. Um, and so he would have these, uh, what was I going to say? And, and so he, he implemented these tariffs. Now, Germany said, well, let's progress to an income tax. The unfortunate part with adopting an income tax is then you have to keep track of your population in your region. And so they had this peaceful region that had French and German people, and they actually had to forcibly take it over. And so this led to, a, this sparked, that sacking of Alsace-Lorraine sparked a whole bunch of other conflicts as people adopted these economic policies, instead of having a general region, they needed specific borders uh, to protect their income tax and protect these social programs, you know, to say, well, if we're going to give out, you know, a welfare, I can't just give it out to everybody. So now we have to hard define our borders and hard to define who are it's, we have to hard define our population and borders. We can't leave that be in some obscure fashion. And so it really required these bigger and bigger governments to which Keynes saw the end, which was serfdom. Uh, it's no coincidence that he talks about serfdom just because that was uh, such a big part of European history and really more recent than we think. I think in America, we think of 1776 and we've got pioneers and explorers and and in that era, we've got a lot of people working on personal occupation. All of Europe was still under a feudal system in 1776. I mean, we're talking kings, vassals, barons, you know, and serfs. And so it, I think it's more impactful to the European for him to use the term, the road to serfdom. Um, I've spoken a lot, <laughs> but um, all right, let's talk about... Uh, Big takeaways from your book, the book that you might have had, big points, or just whatever you feel like talking about. I guess we'll we'll, we'll just leave this open and round robin ish. Whoever wants to hop in. All right, I think yeah. uh, what you said there was uh, he he. I think originally he did uh, he wrote this specifically for the European um, uh, populace because he even said I, I 
so the book that I got, and I think that was part of the issue is I kept reading the introductions, which were multiple pages long, but this got three introductions because there's the original print in the thirties and the seventies reprint and like the nineties yeah. or whatever like that. Um, but he was talking about, he was surprised at the uh, response he got in the U S and obviously the response at that point in time was negative because even in the U S at that point in time, that was after Wilson administration, I believe, and leading up to the war. And there was a push with the, uh, the new deal of more centralized planning. So he was surprised that a, it even hit American stores as it did. And as many people read it, um, but also the negative feedback that he did receive. Um, but it's amazing, you know, and one of the nice things about reading those introductions was he talks about how even at first he didn't know if he was right. There was still some ambiguity in his head of, okay, am I, what am I saying here? Is everything right? And then as time went on, it like solidified every thought that he had because everything fell into place exactly as he had, uh, perceived that it would, especially with um, Soviet Union and the fall of communism. Um, but I think one of the things, I like taking quotes because it seems to be a good... It's got some great quotes, like yeah. great one-liners, great like short paragraphs. I think that uh, this book, among all the ones that we've read, you could probably get like drain the most quotes out of. Yeah, and this one was pretty simple. It was, uh, I think, it was at the start of a par- or a chapter. But what has always made the state of of hell on earth has been precisely that man has tried to make it this heaven. And Holderland, I don't know who, somebody from far back, but I think it, it kind of sets the tone of as much as we think we can control things as a human beings, cause we're so smart and you know, we, we, we're going to be able to control everything. It seems that the more we try to control our surroundings around us, the more it becomes into chaos. Um, sometimes we just have to allow chaos be chaos and understand that there is that and just go with it. Um, so it's kind of what I got. Yeah. Jacob. Yeah. Just the one piggyback comment off of what Hadley was saying, you know, every time you know people come up with these ideas on how government will help out or you know we just need this person in charge or this group in charge i would say most of the people inside of those parties or groups are coming with like you know well intentioned you know i want my team to be in charge because mm-hmm. we're going to be the ones to you know er- usher in this new era of you know prosperity if only the other team got out of my way you know what i mean yeah whereas, whereas hayek takes the approach of like no 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 like it's not your team versus our team. It's collectivism versus individualism, you know? So he's kind of writing this uh, in the middle of this struggle between, you know, Nazi Germany and like fascist Italy. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny that the, uh, the Americans adopted the book so quickly because I'm sure they're ready to read on how, you know, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy having all these issues. But then once, you know, Hayek makes his case that like, no, 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 these same intellectuals that are over here causing mayhem in, in Germany and Italy, like, no, they're in the they're in Britain and they're in the U.S. as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know, once once that mirror got put up to the U.S., all of a sudden the critics came out. You know, it's like, oh well, you know, that that's that's not the Nazis and you know the fascists over there. That couldn't possibly happen to us. And so that was my biggest key takeaway that I got from the book was you know taking a step back and realizing that while there is great things about America, you know, all the good stuff, you know, make America great again, whatever. Like at the same time, like we are not immune from the errors of other nations that they met, that they have uh, done in the past, you know? So um, there's a lot we can learn from other nations. So we don't have to go down that path. And it's kind of depressing because I know we're talking on the, uh, on the message group earlier about, you know, the path our, our government has taken, you know, I made a comment about trench warfare, which nobody's going to get um, on this podcast feed. But anyway, um, you know, just talking about that, it's just, we're going down a path and it's hard to see a way we can stop going down this path. But one of the ways we can do it is just looking back in history and being like, look, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, all these other countries, they've gone down this route. You know what I mean? Like we know what the end state is. So collectivism, equals you know starving genocide all the terrible things of you know the past you know centuries and it's just like why are we why are we still pushing for collectivism when well individualism yeah i'm sure it has some flaws but you know it's kind of like that capitalism quote you know like it's the best option we got right now until proven otherwise you know like let's push for that individualism but i think uh, overall hayek i think that was my biggest key takeaway of the book he did a 
I thought, a good job of just showcasing where collectivism got these nations and where where Britain and the U.S. are starting to go down that path. Now, granted, that was, you know, a while back, so I'm sure, like, looking around now, <laughs> it's probably even more dire than what it was when he wrote the book. But anyway, that was my thoughts and my biggest key takeaways from it. Yeah, those are all great takeaways. Mm-hmm. I, f- I found um, it to be very bone chilling how he kind of predicts world war II, uh and that's frightening he starts writing the book right before it kicks in but talks about how it's inevitable and it's something that did divide him and keynes a lot now keynes even wrote uh, the economic consequence of the peace uh and he was down on the paris uh paris accord and, and as as modern historians, we kind of understand why it was not a good deal. But at the same time, Keynes talked about being in a perpetual state of either in war or preparing for war and the benefits of that to the economy. And now Keynes was right when we got out of war that these countries that had these centralized planners all experienced the depression. And so for me, it was, it's just the self-fulfilling prophecy that if you have centralized planning, you need war. And so when we are in America, of course, we're in a constant state of war or preparing for war. Europe has been like this for the past several hundred years. And this is a direct result of our economic system by saying, hey, if we're spending money on it, it's helping the economy uh, because of the way we've set up the economy. Uh, Hayek's argument is we shouldn't set up an economy like that. That's a very bad thing to base your economy on. It's going to lead to perpetual war. Now, it's funny that he says it, and it sounds like an accusation, but it's something that the Keynesians actually readily admit. Yes, we neither need to always be in a war or always be preparing for war. That was kind of his point uh, with, with a lot of these books, is talking about how it's a state of employment. If you're ever going to be in a war, which does sometimes happen, then you need to constantly um, subsidize those jobs. Even if in times of peace, you should have them as a standing arm ready to kind of prepare for it. Now, of course, this was more bone chilling to the Americans out West who kind of had a problem with a standing army that led to them kind of owning our whole country for a little bit. Uh, but, and so we, we had seen the dangers, but really they just, you know, in Europe, they just hadn't seen the dangers of it yet. Um, I guess he as an Austrian had kind of seen it, but especially in Britain. And, and that was really where everybody was turning to in Europe to, to look, they were looking to them because Britain's economy seemed to be doing well because Keynes and, and for as much as I don't like him, he was actually a very good economist. He was good at what he was doing. He's good at being treasurer. The problem is, is trusting somebody in that position to do it after you're gone. And you're going to have to, you put everybody's trust into one person and they have to try to make the best decision for as many people as possible. Whereas individualism says you need to, you need to do the, what's best for yourself. Um, I think it's funny. I don't know if this is in the preface. This is in the preface, preface by Hayek um, in the book that I wrote. I'm not sure if it was in the versions that you guys read. But he even said, you know, it's funny that I talk, I warn about socialism because the Nazis were socialist and they were embracing all these socialist policies. Um, it's funny how today we call it fascism and it's also fascism, but I mean, they, they considered it socialism and, and that's what they were pursuing as these social programs. But in the preface, he even said, you know, had I known how much more the USSR was going to take it, <laughs> take it, take what Nazi Germany did and run with it, I would have warned against them as well, <laughs> as opposed to just railing against what the Nazis were doing constantly and being like, hey, guys, this is going to lead to war. This is going to lead to socialism. This is going to lead, lead to serfdom and war and all these problems. And then sure enough, it did. I think for me, that's perhaps the brilliance of this book is it's, it's so... It's one thing to to just say what's on your mind, but I think Hayek makes several predictions that have just come true to a T, mm-hmm. um, from war to political parties to um, centralized planning, Nazism, just talking about how these problems that would occur, I, I think he just calls it to a T before it happens. And I think you definitely get, I know for me, I definitely respect an economist who doesn't just say what's on his mind, but is able to accurately predict the future. Economics is supposed to be forecasting. Uh, I think that's a Thomas Sowell quote. Uh, he's one of those libertarian economists that we all know and love. But 
it, it's supposed to be forecasting. You're supposed to be making predictions based off what you do as opposed to just saying, well, I think this will, I, I'm a, I have this opinion or I have that opinion. It's supposed to be predicting the future. And I think in that Hayek just totally nails it. Yeah, I fully would agree with that. Um, and like I said, with his preface, I think the later books is how he was even surprised at how dead on he was. Uh, and that was That's incredible. Right. And um, I guess this is a little bit off topic, but there's this, you know, talking about economists. I was at a, uh, a function and this is off the book, but this company ITR Economics out of New Hampshire, they do in uh, predictive indexes and so on and so forth and for different uh, economies and um, markets and so on and so forth. But one thing they do predict is the next huge depression will be right around 2030. Um, so if anybody is planning or predicting and, and looking at that is that's a big thing to look at because of the a large amount of all the baby boomers are retired, the debt ratio of the U S economy will have at that point in time. I mean, I think over a quarter of the, um, budget at that point in time will either be going to healthcare, uh, interest, interest alone on loans and something else um, retirement I think so 25% of the budget for the United States will be going to interest Medicare and um, Social Security which is kind of unattainable after a while I, th I think that may even be lowballing it because yeah. uh, a quarter already goes to Medicare Medicaid alone is that what okay so yeah, maybe was, part of it, like yeah. interest alone was I, I have the report somewhere it, else. it probably is interest and that yeah. is frightening because interest yeah. right now is like eight percent but it, it's one of those that every year crawls up and up and up. Mm -hmm. It's uh, interest on our debt is the fifth is the thing we spend the fifth most money on. Okay. It's only yeah. behind uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Defense and War, and um, uh, uh, Income Security, Social Programs. Okay. Well, welfare and such. But then right after that, I mean, it's it's a big one already, and mm -hmm. it. It's the one, unlike the others, we can kind of back off of. We're not able to control that right. directly. You know, we, we can set prime, but we've already set prime pretty low. Yeah. And so, it, I mean, we could set it at like 0.1%, but that's going to create more problems than it will solutions. So it, it yeah. Yeah. So, you, 2030, you 2030? 2030. 2030. Okay. Okay. Give it's you to retire then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, you know, they're and I, they've been pretty good. So if anybody looks them up, they've uh, I think they have like a ninety six percent success rate or ninety three somewhere high nineties, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they saw the housing crisis coming, um, the actual dip six to twelve months before it actually happened. Um, but um, anyway, so that uh, the. And actually, it was kind of funny because a guy was talking about it. I wanted to ask him afterwards. I said, you seem to have some libertarian uh, leanings. But as he's kind of like, you know, guess what? When this hits, all the people who think the government are going to be there to help you and bail you out, what are they going to do for you? So you better get your stuff together yourself now and be prepared for when this happens. Because if they can't, if they're going to be in a situation where they're just trying to hold on to, they're not coming to your rescue. Um, so that went way off, a little, little uh, off the board. I I'm actually frightened by how many economists recommend that mm -hmm. by, by saying, yeah, uh, now's about the time to bail out and get ready and be prepared for yourself. And just, you know, and, and, you know, if you have money stuffed in your mat mattress, go ahead and spend it or invest it now, get it out of your mattress because you know, that it's, it's not long for this world. And it's not even li people who identify as libertarians. Obviously, we hang out in those circles, so we're used to kind of the doom and gloom about the federal economy. This is mainstream economists, you yeah. know, and, and so that's, that's pretty harrowing. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, unless we start opening up our borders and start allowing people to come in, the, uh, we've got an upside-down pyramid right now where there's too many people. There's not enough people supporting those that will need the support at that point in time, and it's going to take a little while for Gen Z to get in, which I think is – one of the next biggest generations. That's correct. But I'm, I'm sure okay. I, I haven't looked into that, but, but mm -hmm. perhaps the, uh, yeah, the border situation is scary. The immigrant situation is, is a little scary with how we view them. I think the, the fun, perhaps the most ironic part about all this is the best way to stave off a depression or, or a recession is GDP. 
And the best GDP producers, of course, are the ones crossing our borders illegally. Mm -hmm. That's the rawest form of GDP. You know, mined metals, uh, food, you know, that's, that's very raw. I think a lot of the services will go away, but, but the, uh, you know, as automation continues, but being able to harvest a raw product is always the best uh, supplier of GDP and cutting off workers isn't a good idea. Uh, I mean, to bring it back to the book, that, that's, that's a huge part of what, a ger- of the German problem was when they adopted this centralized economic social welfare model they a progressive tax and everything you know that they went full on with it they found that they had to have hard borders they had to kick people out of the country it affected their gdp they had recessions they had depressions they had problems it's just too much um one of my favorite books of all time and i I, we will not read this next month because everybody deserves a break from economics but uh it is basic economics by thomas Sowell, and it's one i just can't recommend enough to people If, if you are just wondering what economics is and how it works it's just one of the best the best the best books of just saying here's what economics is here's it in play and here's some examples uh, and one of it, he, he goes, so this one talks about the German problem and the British problem. Uh, uh, so will really talks about the, the other problem, the USSR problem and the issues that their centralized planners had and their centralized planners were very open <laughs> in talking about the problems that they, that the, the mistakes that they made. And the idea is that it's not that the free market would get rid of these mistakes. Of course, people will make mistakes. But when something impacts you, you make an immediate fix. If you say, oh, gosh, it looks like that's not a good, ex- you know, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to lose food. I need to make a change. You can make that change instantaneously. In a centralized planning method, sometimes they won't notice you if you're a small enough percent. And so your food will just continue to dwindle down. And sometimes... It just isn't fast enough. You know, they'll say, well, you know, let's take time. Let's review this. Whereas in a free market economy, it will just immediately to any problems that people have. A centralized planning economy just doesn't respond quickly enough. Mm -hmm. You can be like Maynard Keynes, you know, John Maynard Keynes and respond pretty quickly and do a pretty good job and have people like you because, you know, you, you did a lot, a lot of good for a lot of people. But to argue that those people wouldn't have done any good for themselves is a bit uh, a bit assertive, as well as um, as well as then when you retire from secret you know treasury secretary and pretty much the next person totally scuffs the job, that you realize you're always depending on somebody else, and that kind of is what serfdom is. You're always dependent on your baron, who doesn't necessarily care for you or like you. Uh, that's another part of the book that I want to talk about. I think it was in the first thir- uh, third of the book. So highly, you might remember this part. Um, but just talk about how the nature of socialism is always to cater to the lowest common denominator. And so, and, and this was uh, something that hap- that was very evident in Europe when they were under serfdom, is they were the minimum there was, or or I guess I should say the maximum there, the maximum lifestyle was shelter food and water. I have water, I have shelter, I have food. When feudalism fell, and Adam Smith and capitalism actually had a lot to do with that whole fall process. I could talk about that in a different situation, but this is why where this is why Hayek and these other capitalists, you know, look, look to the fall of feudalism so with such a reverence is is then what happened is what replaced it was instead of the maximum being barely getting by and living, which a lot of people weren't because that was the maximum. So you look at people that weren't getting that maximum. They didn't always have shelter. They didn't always have food. They didn't have water. When these, when these feudal Lords were, were dispersed of and people were able to operate individually, that became the new minimum. Everybody had shelter. Uh, land is a false scarcity that the government does sometimes. It really isn't scarce. You can fit the entire population of the globe right now comfortably into the size of New Zealand. I read an article about that the other day. So the only reason land seems scarce is because the government makes it scarce. Really, it's literally <laughs> dirt cheap because it's just dirt. And uh, it, 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 it's, 
and food. We have an excess of food. Government has to make it look scarce, and they do. Central planners step in. Not They don't phrase it because they want to make it look scarce. They don't say, well, we want to starve people to death. They just say, well, a lot of people's jobs depend on it being very expensive or it being this amount of expense. And if it gets cheaper than that, what happens in a capitalist system when you have excess, when you have too much supply? then people aren't gonna pay for it as much. But that's kind of the entire point. So this is what happened in, in the fall of feudalism in Europe is food went from, oh, all the lords and ladies have it and they let us have some sometimes to guys, there's a ton of this. We barely have to pay for this. It's, it's very cheap. You know, this, this is very easy to get to acquire. There's so much of it, you know, we take it for granted. And so what happened is, you know, uh, this is the late stages of the Silk Roads but you had then the maximum became the luxuries instead of the, uh, you know, the silks, uh, things that only the lords and ladies were getting before silks, spices, herbs, um, salt, uh, tulips, flowers. I mean, we're talking, you know, the decoration of life then became the thing that you were working for and the minimum standard of living, which you really didn't have to work for was all that, shelter food and water and it's something that hayek notices that i just think is so touching i think if really it's what makes me identify i'm a capitalist self-professed and i think that that's really what makes it so beautiful what he's talking about is we're no longer watching a toil to try and have shelter food water under capitalism you had the toil was to get silks spices you know luxury items that's what you had to work for and socialism by necessity when it's this when it's this government run socialism it will always cater to that lowest common denominator which is again why he calls it the road to serfdom because you go from competing to have the highest quality of life to competing to being barely alive you have to you know work work like heck to even stay barely alive there are several mutualists who even acknowledge this, uh, uh, PJ Pr Prudhomme being one of them, but socialists who just acknowledge this, but argue that it's a good thing that man works to stay barely alive. And that is really um, antithetical to what we believe. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't speak for everybody, but at the very least to what Hayek believes, where he says we need to be competing for the maximum standard of living as opposed to the minimum. Sorry, I talked a lot. You guys can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. I mean, you obviously have a, a, a large knowledge of the history of uh, surrounding all of it. But I think uh, what, it's, what is incredible with capitalism um, is, I th well, Peterson talks about this, Jordan Peterson, if, kind of off topic, but like life is chaos, okay? So... The uh, Taoists believe the yin and the yang. It's, you know, there's 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 always chaos, and you're living within it. So, um, capitalism basically, you're just living within that chaos of okay, if there's too much of something, the price goes down, which then writes itself because then people won't provide that service or, yes. you know, grow that food anymore. So then they stop growing it. So then the the, the uh, supply goes down and then the prices regulate again. So those that were maybe more successful in how they did it or weren't as wasteful or had a, a little bit of a uh, rainy day fund set aside, they'll still be there and then they'll reap the benefits later on because they were technically, I guess, the stronger of the, the providers. And then maybe later on, maybe a whole bunch of people fall off and then the, actually the price goes up again and more people want to get back involved. So it's a constant ebb and flow of the situation. Um, as much as you, you know, if, if I think the problem is, and that goes back to the quote I said earlier, if, if we try to control too much of things or it's just not going to happen. Um, I mean, try to control even just another human being, like one human being, you, you can't do it. They're their, their own individual. Um, I think that's the thing we forget of. Obviously we are a collective, like there's more to a society and a, a, um, a country or whatever. And I believe, um, but still it's filled full of individuals and they're going to do what's, what's right for them. And I think, uh, I, I've also served on committees and other things before. Um, and it's always interesting that, you know, things just don't get done very quickly. If you've got multiple people involved and they've also have their own political side that maybe it's something that's going on you start having centralized planning things, 
I guess with government is good because sometimes things happen slowly, so we don't overreact. But again, now you have that slow aspect trying to fill the needs where potentially people in situations in communism, so on and so forth, are dying. They are starving and they can't make the decision to get food to them quick enough. Whereas if the, the market's there, somebody, an entrepreneur will say, Ooh, there's a market over here. People need food and I'm going to go take them food and I'm going to make money. Okay, great. So I think what's amazing is, you know, serving a committees and doing other things that you can see that things take a while to come to fruition and sometimes they don't at all. So now you're putting that into government's hands and saying, you know, you figure it out. Mm. Yeah. Like, well, uh, and Jacob, I do want to give you a turn. Let me interject. Real right. I, I don't even if, you, yeah. And I'm going to let you finish. Hadley, I don't know if you know how brilliant that is because, and I don't know if you knew this, one of the problems in the USSR was they had a superfood excess. They just couldn't get it to them. It mm -hmm. rotted in stores. So that's, that's a very brilliant point that, that that's just one of those things. That the decision to get it to them quickly, it doesn't happen quickly enough. You can, a centralized planner can produce it that way, but mm -hmm. it really takes a market to distribute. Go ahead, Jacob. Okay, so I have like 10 bullets. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, <laughs> do it, do it. Hit us well, all, hit us with all 10. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll give you guys uh, this one final comment on what you guys just talking about with the food and the distribution. Uh, you know, most recently, look at Haiti. You know, how mm -hmm. much food sat out on the port, you know, not out at sea because it couldn't go to the ports because, of, you know, basically like, politics is getting in the way, mm -hmm. you know? So like food just rotting out there, you know, Haiti's in need, whereas, you know, I again like what could a private organization have done better we don't know because you know the government usually takes a monopoly on you know providing that you know foreign aid through the uh, agency usa you know so i mean what what could have been you know we don't know uh similar to again if you want to use another example just like the ebola outbreak when that happened and you know obama's like you know we're going to send the military you know over there which you know if, if nobody knows why the military got sent i can tell you why it's because we have readily available a lot of the tent structures that could create a hasty quarantine but we were so ineffective at getting there that by the time we got there and built these like mobile tent quasi hospitals we wound up building like 14 of them and only used two of them and even the two we used was basically you know when the whole thing was already wrapping up which conveniently you know we got to take credit for it. like oh man we showed up and help you know beat up ebola never mind the fact that it was already on the decline while we were getting shipped over there you know so it's like uh, i guess you can be a product of good timing with that i suppose but um anyway that was just my comment on uh, distribution of assets um not a good track record overall um <laughs> and i'm sure everyone has a bunch more examples you know new orleans all the good stuff but um uh, my final comments on the hayek book uh, i like that he made a point to just keep referring to these things as like collectivism these things being like the different you know, versions of whatever the government's pushing at that time. And I think that's a good thing to keep in mind is, you know, sometimes we get, you know, caught up on the semantics. You know, people are like, well, that's not real socialism. That's not real communism. I say, okay, like, whatever. Like, are you trying to collect the assets underneath one government agency? Yes. Okay, cool. Call it what you want. I don't want that. You know what I mean? Like, I want, you know, personal liberties. I want freedoms. This is what I want. You know, so whatever you want to call it, I don't care. If you're going the collectivist route, which I think Hayek does a good, job explaining why that's bad you know that's what i don't want a part of you know um then the other comment i had uh you mentioned the book basic economics earlier yeah they're really solid tie-in you know with that in the book you know the whole that book starts off great it, mis it initially jumps straight into the uh the whole like broken window fallacy yeah which we have a huge problem of in here you know we're talking about the military earlier it's like man look at all the great things you know we we spend on you know we're spurring this on you know there's that factory in Ohio that does all these, you know, tank parts, like whatever, like insert, like whatever state, whatever part of the military government. And they're like, what, like, you know, look at all these jobs you're creating, you know, jobs, 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 whatever. It's like, you're missing the point though. It's like, if these organizations got to put the money, you know, where they saw best to make a profit, you know, outside of, you know, using the tax dollar for profits, you know, you would have something that's long, like long lasting post war. You know, it's really hard to shut down a war when you have become reliant on these things. And I should say, you know, I'm, I'm pro army, standing army to, to an extent. You know, I know it's a libertarian podcast. I shouldn't say that too loud. But 
you know, um, I believe in having a military. I just, I've said this before to the libertarian groups that like, I just think the way we are doing it right now is, you know, like 90% more than what I envisioned it for, you know, like, should we be able to provide for a defense? Yes. Should we be in, I don't know, like 80 countries, you know, doing an ungodly amount of things without Congress, congressional approval? Like, no, that's, that's where we, you know, pull back, you know, mm -hmm. um, being, being in the, you know, having that military background, I understand why it's, you know, necessary to have a standing army because you want to start one from scratch that can go toe to toe on a minute's notice, you know, against a foreign adversary. Yeah. Like you can't just flip that switch on and you know, you have that there now where we are is the extreme. So, you know, there's maybe there's a whole nother podcast. I, uh, we can talk about that one day on a, on a further book episode, but that's just my kind of comments on that. And I think my last uh, final bullet point, um, kind of talking about, you know, that government, uh, you talked about earlier about the prices, you know, I tell you right now, government agencies don't care about the price tag because they're not for profit. You know what I mean? It's like, there's no, there's no risk involved when it's taxpayer money from the government perspective. You know, we can pour all this money into this project and they fail and it's like, well, you know, better luck next time. Let's get some more money, you know? Um, so that kind of sucks. And I think Hayek does a, a good job of expressing that as well. Um, then the final comment I had on here that I was going to mention was, um, I know capitalism lately has been getting kind of a bad rap, you know, about, you know, people are failing underneath the capitalism. And I just, I don't know if anybody or enough, excuse me, I don't know if enough people are coming out and just saying like, yeah, like, guess what? Like capitalism can be tough. Like you can absolutely fail inside of the capitalist umbrella, you know, as an individual. But I think the rewards we've been reaping as a whole, like the cumulative, like uh, consolidation of those gains, it's, it's massive, you know, like, yeah, you can fail into capitalism, but man, have we succeeded through it, you know, like as a, as a country, as a people, however you want to like label that, you know, and I don't know, I just, uh, in the words of Hody, like I am pro-capitalism and it's, it's about time somebody said like, hey, like it's okay to be pro-capitalism, like you can get a couple of punches from some people that like to laugh, uh, you know, like, like to yell from the cheap seats, you know, but like whatever, you know, like by and large, it is the best system that's available out there right now. And if it's between that and collectivism, I think Hayek has showed us why capitalism should be the winner in this. So I think those are my final comments. And if anyone else wants to close it up. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we'll come back to you. We're going to decide uh, what book we want to do next month. But the uh, man, I, I, I will also provide my final thoughts. Uh, what you said about mono basically monopoly or collectivism under any name is bad. There is a quote that I dug up here. Our freedom of choice in a competitive society rests on the fact that if one person refuses to satisfy our wishes, we can turn to another. But if we face a monopolist, we're, it's at his absolute mercy. And an authority directing the whole economic system of the country would be the most powerful monopolist conceivable. It would have complete power to decide what we are, we are to be given and on what terms. It would not only decide what commodities and services would be, were to be available and in what quantities, it would be able to direct their distributions between persons to any degree it liked. And if that doesn't basically sum up the crap that we're going through right now, um, I did do a debate actually one week ago today with a socialist um, I was the capitalist and he was a, a mutualist, which is a specific type of socialism. Um, and I love capitalism. I've been thinking about putting that debate on the show, but it is two hours long. And um, I don't know. Well, show. It's fun. Yeah. You think so? Would you like to, would you yeah. be cool to listen to that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I ripped it up. Even he posted on his Facebook. He was like, he definitioned me right out of the debate with his opening statement. And I was like, good. I, <laughs> I, I, I want to, you know, people to understand what capitalism is. The system that we have is very perverse. Uh, it is very wrong. You have to think about, I mean, our currency itself is distributed by uh, the Fed. It's, it, it, we are so far away from what capitalism is. The funny thing is capitalism, uh, Let's see here. We the wealth of the theory of wealth in nations was actually written in seventies and seventy six. We'd already been fighting a war. We hadn't even the capitalism wasn't even theorized yet. Uh, by the time we started a revolution, it didn't catch on in Europe until uh, I think seventeen eighty nine was when um, it finally caught in Europe and and things fell down. It actually was more popular with um, the Hindus, and Muslims out east 
on the Silk Roads uh, before. It's funny because Adam Smith was a Scot, but it actually got more famous out east than it was out west um, and didn't translate back there then. So a lot of people are like, oh, you just say America wasn't founded on capitalism because you're trying to protect capitalism. No, that's 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 the truth. We fought a whole war. We were done. We had a central bank and everything before all of a sudden, you know, Adam Smith got popular. And then we tried to embrace some of his ideas. We actually disbanded the central bank, I think 12 years after we established it, but we just replaced it with something else, which is just as bad and just as centralized. And, and so there's a lot of problems that we had here in America. And a lot of it's because I applaud us for at least pretending to emulate capitalism, because at least that's something uh, that's a lot better than pretending to emulate. Uh, I mean, you look at the communist countries that pretended to emulate um, freedom-based socialism and that those are ugly, right? Um, I mean, the three biggest incidents of losses of life in the last hundred years were all political, all in communist or all in uh, socialist countries, I should say. Um, Germany, the USSR and China. Um, I guess my final thoughts on the book is I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's smart. I will say if you already hate socialism, you could skip it. I, I know that like, I, I, it sounds almost sacrilege to say about the book, but I, I think if you've hung out in libertarian circles enough, I think we owe this book a lot of credit due to its history because I, I, I can tell how this book has influenced modern libertarian thinking. But I think if you've already come into modern libertarian thinking, you've already heard a lot of what's in the book. So I, I hate to say don't read it. It's a great read, but it's very comfortable. It's very, and it kind of caters to what you already understand. The quotes are awesome. If you need quotes about why socialism and collectivism and whatever ism is bad, like Jacob said, this is the book for you. If you need a lot of, a lot of those examples of how individualism is good, socialism is bad. If you need necessarily to be more convinced that individualism is good and socialism is bad, I, I guess this book isn't for you because it, he just kind of reiterates it uh, is what I would say. But uh, yeah, that's kind of all I have. Jacob actually knocked out a lot of what I was going to say in my clothes and stuff. So Hadley, uh, what would you like? Ah. To I have to follow the two of you. Um, <laughs> no, I think you guys nailed it on the head. Again, I haven't read through the whole book, um, but a lot of it, I've kind of like what you were just saying, Hody. I mean, a lot of it that I was reading, I've kind of, been, I was like, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. Right. Got it. But I think it is a great uh, book. It's not a hard read. Like I, I it, it can get a little dry, I think. Um, but it's not like you had mentioned earlier, there's not graphs. It doesn't go too deep. It just kind of lays it out pretty much on an elementary level of, okay, socialism is bad. Why? And this is why, uh, and different scenarios and, and shows it. Um, so I, I am going to finish it and then I will try to make sure that I finish the next book that we choose here shortly. Um, but uh, also, if anybody is still listening at this point, for good on you, and I'll, please join us. You know, so uh, I love hanging out with Hody and Jacob uh, every month. But it'd be great to be hearing from a couple different voices, uh, even if you don't have, you're not full in. Like when I joined this book club, I have, I was not full in. I was nervous to come on the first time because you know I get to speak to Hody, see him all over the place, and Chris jumps on every once in a while. But it'd be great to have a couple other faces. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I guess we've gone uh, full circle here. Did you guys have a uh, preference for one of you, what you wanted to read uh, next month? We, uh, we're going to have a shortened month because we had to delay a week this month. So um, I, I, will, I will post uh, this Goodreads. Uh, I, I just thought of this. I, have ac I just gained access to the Facebook group. And I've been doing li like live streams out of that instead of as uh, on top of the podcast, the regular podcast, I've been doing the live stream for the dailies out of that. Um, we got a lot of views out of there. So I should probably post something about the book club in there as well. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested. But yeah, any, any book, uh, I know Hadley you had several last month and we decided to go with, uh, with the, um, the road to serfdom. Cause I, I just felt like we deserved some economy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't really think of any right now off the top of my head. That would be great. Uh, I would just add on to what Hadley said. If you are listening, um, use me as an example that you don't need to be, um, good with the words if you want to come on the podcast. So 
uh, please join us. But in terms of book recommendations, um, I really don't have any right now. Um, none that we haven't already covered. If we do wind up going with the another econ book and we do the base economics, um, I already read that book, so I am pro that choice because you know, like done, let's keep it going. Dude, I, I think maybe not next month. I don't want to back to back everybody with econ, but let's definitely make a plan to do it eventually. Uh, because that book, I'm sure you agree, Jacob, is awesome. That is, uh, I, I wish it were required reading for everybody. I mean, it's called basic economics, so what can you do? Hody, uh, once you, uh, I think Dale brought up a book last month. I forget it was more on a uh, personal development level. And I know you and Dale have been doing some dailies in that. Uh, I don't know. That would kind of, uh, dovetail off that. I don't remember. <laughs> what it was called. I just totally zone out when Dale's talking. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, you know, I mean, it's a shorter book, but didn't you say Catcher in the Rye you wanted to read at some point? I did, yeah. And that's that's shorter, and we're on a shortish uh, schedule yeah. here this month. You, would you I've, guys... I've read that book. It's have good. you read it? Mm -hmm, I have. I, I read a lot of them. Okay. Yeah, I've read it as well, here. but it could be a fun <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Would would you care to at least discuss it, Jacob? Then? <laughs> oh no, I I read it like like ten years ago, so I would one hundred percent reread it just so I can have some talking points. I when I say I read it, it was like one of those like you should read it like in college, and I did, and so it's been a while. <laughs> I'm in the same place. They don't have it on audiobook, so I will actually have to physically read it. So, uh, but but I I am definitely down to do that. Yeah. yeah. Would that be cool with you? I mean, what was that something you suggested last month, Hadley? Is that yeah. It? Okay. Yep. I wanted to throw you a bone. So if it's not something you suggest, we can totally skip it. But yeah. Nice. Well, let's uh let's do that then. Let's read catch let's make it a plan. Catcher in the right next month. It'll kind of be our first non-self-help, non-politics, non-economics, you know. Mm -hmm. It'll just be a nice scholarly read for you scholars. So yes. screw it. Let's do Alice Shrugged. Oh, it. Short, yeah. month, short month, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> that book took me over a year to read. Have you read it? Have you both read it? No, yeah. I have not. I oh, have okay. Not. I have. <laughs> Jacob, uh, you, well, I think we have to divide that into three months, right? Because that, that's like the, uh, the book club for the year. Like, yeah. I'll see you guys next February. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, I have the, I, I love the Bible, right? Yeah. You know, I, I listen to an audio book. And so whenever something is longer on uh, Audible, like I, I don't actually see the pages, but whenever it takes longer to read on Audible than the Bible, I'm just like, so I'm in for an adventure here and Atlas Shrug right. is on the list. I actually <laughs> uh, did physically read Atlas Shrug, but I just looked at the Audible to see how long it was. And I was like, oh my. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a long couple of road trips. Yeah, yep. it's, a, it's a good book. But it is a good book. <laughs> it's a very good book. And I started, I was about a quarter way through Fountainhead too before the book club started. So I had to put that aside as well because that one is oh, pretty big as well. I have not read Fountainhead. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, guys, we'll make that a plan. Uh, again, good talking with you. If you're listening, that means you're a Patreon subscriber. And thank you. Thank you. We love you. We need you. Uh, please, please encourage people to join the book club. You can join in yourself, even if you are uh, scared, like they said, or nervous, or even if you didn't read the book. We just love to have other. Uh, I, I find that so often with these books, you kind of get the idea and we talk about these ideas. And the whole point is talking about the ideas from the book. You know, if it's just reiterating the book, then you just read the book, you know? And so, so you're certainly welcome to join us if you, if you have some more things to say, but Hadley, uh, Hadley and Jacob, again, it was awesome to talk with you both. I, I treasure, I treasure this time every month. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's been great. What, and uh, what are we doing? Which, which uh, do we have the date for next one? Yeah. Uh, here, let me, let me bust open my calendar here. Is it the 26th? Or, yeah, most likely. You're, you're probably right here. Let's see. Here. That's the last Monday or yeah. last Sunday. Last Sunday. It'll be the 26th. Three okay. weeks. All right. So we'll Very see good. you guys. We'll talk uh, Catcher in the Rye then. Uh, have a good day, everybody. All right. Have a good one. Later.